Welcome, friends. In case you missed that, I'm Amanda Chicago Lewis. I'm a journalist. I write a column for Rolling Stone. So uh, here's what we're going to do. It's 9.36. We're going to do about 40, 45 minutes of me uh, asking very polite, appropriate, non-pressing questions to our lovely panel here. Um, as you can see, the cannabis industry is very female these days. Um, and then we're going to do a Q&A. So expect a Q&A around 10.15. And Susan, the lineup for the Q&A is? on my left, stage right, all right? So here's, sure, whatever that was. Um, uh, so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna introduce each person on the panel, and as I introduce them, I'm gonna ask them a specific question that I've come up with, mostly out of my own curiosity, because uh, I'm a curious person. So let's start with Assemblymember Joan Sawyer. Uh, Reg Joan Sawyer, a uh, very prominent vote for cannabis in the California legislature, represents parts of South Los Angeles. Uh, Assembly member, my question for you is, are you satisfied with the pace that the city of Los Angeles is moving at, cannabis-wise? Good morning. As a resident of South Los Angeles and uh, a former professor who retired um, city employee. I worked 25 years with the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a recovering bureaucrat. And so I actually know probably why the city moves at its pace. Uh, the, big, the one of the reasons why I ran is because elected officials like me, I can talk about me now, uh, used to come up with laws and then force it on bureaucrats. And a lot of times we didn't give them enough resources, enough uh, money, and sometimes it was just a stupid ass idea. But we had to, we, we would have to make it happen. I think in this case, a lot of times, elected officials come up with ideas and then put it out there, and then they hire a cat, a cat packer. Then they hire other people to make it happen. What they should have done was talk to the bureaucracy and say, how do we make this happen? How do we ensure that, um, that we get it at the right pace, but more important, that we do it right? The city of Los Angeles is struggling between making sure we do it right and getting it actually done. And I think what happens with not just LA, any law that comes out, um, we ultimately have a gridlock or things don't get done or money sits in accounts somewhere where people saying that the, the bureaucracy too onerous, when in fact what we probably need to do is step back, the city of Los Angeles needs to step back talk to the individuals here who have to implement that law and those who will have to ultimately make it happen and have another conversation. Okay. Because it's not moving as fast as it should. All right, it's not moving as fast as it should. If you, you're not aware, the city of Los Angeles, biggest and most important cannabis market on the planet, moving very slowly with licensing businesses. Uh, you heard it here first. Assemblymember Joan Sawyer, we're doing the best that we can. He understands the bureaucracy and the reasons why it's moving slowly, but we should be moving faster. Our next panelist, Hezekiah Allen, third generation cannabis grower from Humboldt County, has spent the last five years fighting for his community in Sacramento, first on behalf of the Emerald Growers Association, now on behalf of the California Growers Association. Key to note, neither association is only for growers. Industry-wide, California Growers Association, biggest industry group in California. Hezekiah has announced he is leaving his position at the end of the year to move into business. Hezekiah, did I misread that announcement or did you say nobody should replace you? Question mark? Um, I, I did say that. Um, I, it, to, to use Mr. Jones Sawyer's, uh, you know, we as staff of associations are sort of like your bureaucrats and sometimes our board tells us to do things and then maybe doesn't come up with the money or doesn't follow through and so, I, I think that the you know, what I'm recommending is that the licensees themselves step up, um, and you know that we have a matrix management structure that puts board and staff in more constant contact with more touch points between the two. I think a, a slightly hybrid management model will serve the organization and the industry, and allow us to really maintain our, our triple mandate to the businesses, but also to the communities and to the places where we do business. So um, I am encouraging that we get new age with it and look at a matrix management structure and. and um, encourage every single one of you. What that means is that we need more folks to step up 
into leadership positions. So encourage every one of you to get involved with your friendly association, whether it's ours, Aaron's, or any of the other ones. We all need you guys. So um, you did read that, right? All right, Hezekiah, one of a kind, never forget. Uh, our next panelist, Aaron Smith, Executive Director of the National Cannabis Industry Association. More of a Colorado, D.C. person than a California person, but we'll forgive him for that. Aaron, what do you know about Trump's Washington and cannabis that we don't? Uh, I'm a native Californian, by the way. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> um, well, you know, like, like anything that you're reading with the, the Trump administration, there's a little bit of schizophrenia there. <laughs> and uh, we're, so you're seeing uh, sort of a revolt with the staff on, all, on a myriad of issues. If you've, if you've read uh, any of the, the recent articles or anonymous sources, uh, and that pretty much uh, comports with what we're hearing out of the White House, which is that there is a uh, a very concerted effort on the part of White House staff to undermine the industry, uh, led by. Uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who is not uh, really in the president's favor right now. Um, that said, uh, we are confident that uh, at least the president uh, is, is philosophically more in alignment uh, with the state's rights approach on this issue, as, as he has said uh, in his support for the States Act and, and of course, throughout the, the campaign prior to that. Uh, so it's you know, continuing to uh, educate those at the staff level uh, that if we're going to really look at the cannabis issue as their, their, their recently announced commission or uncovered the commission that is looking at the cannabis issue from a very negative perspective on how to undo uh, the, the, the facts, they call it the messaging, but the facts that regulation works, is that they need to be looking at the whole picture and, and looking at this and, and how this is beneficial to the community as well as maybe some of the negative impacts that, that are out there that I would say are clearly outweighed by the positive. Gotcha. So Aaron, of course, referring to the uh, secret commission that we discovered existed at the Department of Justice recently, looking into the cannabis industry and how to undermine it, and letting us know that, yes, there are people in Washington who hate cannabis, but maybe the White House is too much of a mess to really do anything about it. <laughs> yeah? Uh, our next panelist, Max Mikalonis. Uh, Max was a staff... Yes, did I say it correctly? Okay. Max was a staffer for uh, Assemblymember Rob Bonta when the original many, many, three years ago, a uh, version of the rules of legalization was being put together in Sacramento. Now he works as a lobbyist slash consultant. I get confused about those words. They're all kind of meaningless. Uh, Max is a, a very deep policy wonk, and I want to ask you, Max, since you understand everything that's going on in a lot of detail that people don't necessarily understand themselves, what is the biggest confusion that you are seeing? What is the biggest misunderstanding that people have about what's going on in California? Very good question. Um, <laughs> I think I think the biggest confusion that is out there, that's still out there, is in, and I don't think we have an answer to this, is what's going to happen on January 10th, 2019? What's going to happen when the collective model finally gets phased out? And what is enforcement going to look like? What is the medicinal market going to look like? What will the adult use market look like? And how have we moved? Because you know, Senate Bill 420 uh, going lapse one year after the Bureau issued uh, notice, and that day is January 9, 2019, is when the Senate Bill 420 collective pressures will expire. So what's gonna happen then, and without any legal protections from prosecution for medicinal operators that have been in the, the legacy market, in the gray market, how will the state respond? And you know, for those folks, what plans and what steps have they been taking over this last year to enter the regulated market and try to work with their local governments and get licensed? So I think that there's been a lot of people hoping, and even, to, even the last week I heard people saying, we're gonna get that pushed back, right? That, that's not gonna happen, right? And no, it's happening. And how the industry deals with that, how law enforcement deals with that, and what steps are taken between now and then I think are critical. Yeah, so in case you weren't clear on that, uh, Max referring to the fact that we have all of these cannabis dispensaries in California that are not technically licensed by the state that are operating under what will soon be obsolete uh, legal protections as quote unquote collectives. They aren't supposed to be for profit. Um, whether that's actually true obviously depends on the uh, on the store in question, uh, but what is going to happen when we sunset those protections as thin as they are? Are we gonna see a huge wave of enforcement crackdown? All right, and now finally, former California Attorney General uh, and current 
something high up at C4 Distro, a distribution company. Sorry, Eric. Uh, Mr. Bill Lockyer. Uh, Mr. Lockyer, do you regret being part of the war on drugs now that you are profiting off of legalization? <laughs> So, someone who used to burn about 20 million plants a year, and of course, most of the burners wanted to be downwind from the event. Um, that was the job, uh, and it was came with the office. Now, of course, I also, as a candidate who supported uh, 215, when I ran for attorney general, I had all the narcs opposing me because that was my view, and of course, uh, supported Prop 64. So. Um, my views haven't changed over the years, but my responsibilities have, and so I'm happy to be part of, with Eric Spitz, the distribution center of uh, this particular enterprise. All right, I'm enjoying our political answers this morning, which are everybody who works in government is just doing the best with the responsibilities they've been given. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So I want to do, I think, a good, a good question that I think everybody can answer. Uh, maybe let's max these answers out at like one sentence just so we can sort of like poll the, the crew on this. I'm wondering, what is the biggest challenge for cannabis legalization in California right now? What is the biggest single challenge we are facing? Cracking down on the illegal market. Cannabis still isn't legal in most of the state. Mm -hmm. And the underlying problem is that cannabis is not legal at the federal level. Lack of sufficient retail access for the licensed supply chain. Well, since everyone popped something that came from their particular expertise, maybe as a government teacher long ago, the one I ought to say, because of the snarky comments about government, that uh, most people don't understand. We have a governmental system designed not to work. It's why there's three branches of government, three levels of government, all the vetoes and overrides and all that stuff. It's very slow, and, and it takes a long time. Examples would be women's right to vote, a lot of other examples, but it takes a long time to move it all in the same direction. And partly it takes the community here and outside to work together in a unified way to make progress, whether it's enforcement or banking or the other issues that people have mentioned. Thank you. And also, I'm equal opportunity snark. I'm in the snark industry, too. <laughs> so we're talking a little bit here about uh, the illicit market. Uh, and I think most of us in this room are aware that, especially in Southern California, we've got illicit businesses outnumbering licensed businesses 10 to 1. Um, since this is a very Sacramento-oriented panel, I think, I'm curious, is there anything the state can do about the illicit market? And if so, what? Regulate it. Yeah. What, what does that mean? I need more information. Give them licenses. Yes. So the only difference between an illegal business and a legal business is a license, and it's incredibly pretentious of those of us who have licenses to condemn the rest of us to jail. Yeah. <laughs> so are you saying make it much easier for people to get licenses? Make it cheaper? Absolutely. 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 Reduce the barriers to entry. Let people in. Deal with it as a civil matter. If you can't run a business, you're going to fail. This market's incredibly saturated. There's way too much product. Most businesses won't make it. But a failing business should not be a jail cell. It should not be civil forfeiture, asset forfeiture. Um, you know, Three years ago, we were all illegal businesses. 20 years ago, um, we were all really, really illegal. And guess what? That's what it took for us to get here. That, that was all of the hard work that went into this. Um, you know, that we, we need to reduce the barriers to entry. We need to bring more businesses in. We need to support Aaron at the federal level so that we can have an actual real market 
California is the global powerhouse in agriculture. We supply the world with so many commodities. If you told California almond growers that they could only sell in state, it would be a disaster. Olives, tomatoes, whatever crop it is. We need to follow through on this fight and we need to not lock people up in the meantime. The war on drugs, as Senator De Leon mentioned, impacted poor people and poor people of color specifically. Those are exactly the same people that are getting impacted now. I know I represent 850 unlicensed businesses. These are hardworking folks that have been engaged in this process for several years and they're still unlicensed. They're poor and they are minorities. That is who is going to get swept up into this nonsense exactly the same as they always have. We need to reduce the barriers to entry. We need to push hard on local control, make sure there are permits everywhere so that we can bring the, regu the, the market. Regulation needs to come to the market. We don't need to start over and build a new regulated market. Yeah. So as uh, someone that represents individuals with a war of crime, with a war of people who look like me and Latino, as the chair of public safety, and I've been in more prisons than everyone in this room put together, probably outside this room, and all I've seen is African Americans and Latinos. Most of them were put in jail because of cannabis. I agree we need to work real hard to ensure we get more people into the system that we get more legal. That's what I work for. That's why I did the bills on, on medical marijuana and I worked to make sure that it was legalized for adult use because I, I honestly felt that individuals from my community who were on the street selling marijuana, then they sell it in the city statewide, some became national, some became international cannabis dealers um, without a degree from USC or Harvard or from Wharton. They didn't have a business degree, they didn't, they, but they understood marketing accounts receivable, payable, all of that stuff. Now that you want to be legal, and a lot of you want it to be legal, that means you're coming into my world. But when you come into my world, you come into the government world, and as Mr. Lockyer said, that's a different world. To protect you as you come in, the reason I said the biggest, largest problem we're gonna have is the illegal market, because if that market can still undercut you because they don't pay taxes. Remember, you guys told me you wanted this to be legal, and you were really willing to pay taxes. You're jumping up and down saying, as long as we get in, we'll pay taxes. Now all of you, most of you sound like Republicans. We're paying too much taxes. <laughs> you turn Republican overnight, and I understand that. But understand, when you, when you let the fox into the chicken coop, and a couple of chickens are missing, don't come complaining to me because a couple of chickens are missing. Government taxes, that's what we do. Um, and Democrats, unfortunately, we're not really good with tax credits and, and tax breaks and all that, so we, we still need to work on that. And I even had a bill to give your businesses tax breaks so you could thrive. But what will ultimately undercut, and what I'm hearing is the illegal business across the street can sit there and set their price below you because they know they're not paying taxes. And so if you think you can thrive and we can just let these businesses just stay open, and like in LA, was it 130 to over 1,100 illegal? If you think you can out do those illegal without us doing something to actively shut them down, then you're living in that fox in the chicken coop analogy. Think it through. We've got to do something to shut them down. And I tried to get $75 million into the budget this year, which Jerry Brown said no. And he said no because he's waiting for the profits to come in. So which comes first, the chicken or the eggs? So I'm trying to tell him, for you to thrive, we've got to give you tax breaks, we've got to, we've got to do some things, but most important, we've got to make sure you can compete, not only against each other, but ultimately you also got to compete with the illegal market. And we've got to be able to make sure that you are able to do that and not at a decided disadvantage because they can sell their products much cheaper than you. And I can go across the street and get it. If nobody's gonna bother me, guess where I'm gonna go? Across the street to get the same product you got. So please, think this thing through or at least give us help. I don't wanna throw a whole bunch of African American Latino men, women in jail. That is not the purpose of shutting them down. There's ways we can shut them down without filling our prisons. So if you work with us, you work with the government, we can do this right. Yeah.
Yeah, I think two very valid answers. My sense is that there's some, the inconsistency is really, are the people who are in the illicit market there intentionally, or are they trying to get into the legal market? And I think those are probably two different populations, but I think what both of you said is valid. Does anyone else want to add to the illicit market conversation? Yeah. You know, just to touch on uh, the two points made previously, two speakers previously, you know, with, you know, 1,100 unlicensed retailers in the city of LA, I think it's the number Rajiv said, there's only 135 licensed retailers in the city of LA. So before we go and say shut down the 1,100, we need to give them a shot to come into the marketplace and figure out which one of those actually want to make it, which one of those are bad actors, are not intending to comply, and right. things like that. So that's just the merger of both comments. Right. So whatever incentives this, or support the state can supply to the cities or to them, whether it's a carrot or a stick approach on, on support, on revenue, on whatnot, because you know, just, you, I, I think uh, you know, Jack uses this parable, you can't go turn off one faucet without turning on another. You can't just shut down the legal market without providing a pathway forward into the legal market. Right, and I think you know the latest numbers to clarify there, what I've seen is we're at 164 licensed retailers in the city of Los Angeles. The city controller has said there are 1,700 illicit retail operations, obviously very difficult to track. And in case you aren't aware, there's not a timeline yet for when illicit dispensaries in the city of Los Angeles will even be able to apply for licensure. There's not even a timeline for when that's going to happen, let alone funding. Um, so let's move on to another fun question. Uh, and Max and Bill, this might be more for you. Um, so I think we all saw a very interesting thing happen in Sacramento with delivery statewide this year. Uh, and we don't need to get into that argument too much, but I do want to summarize what happened in terms of there was a bill moving around the legislature um, around will uh, delivery operations be able to deliver to every municipality, regardless of whether they have a commercial sales ban. Uh, and then after that bill fell out of the legislature, um, we saw the Bureau add that as a rule uh, in their latest proposed rules. I'm just curious, as someone who sometimes finds Sacramento very confusing, is there a way for people to understand better in the future what is the legislature's responsibility and what is the Bureau's responsibility, the Bureau of Cannabis Control, of course, is what we're referring to here? Yeah, just uh, not going to make the details there, but with the legislature, the responsibility to you know, pass laws and act laws, get them approved, um, have them be voted on by Reggie and then uh, be signed by the governor. Um, or something over Jen Sawyer, sorry. Um, and, and then be signed by the governor. And then it's up to the agencies to implement those laws. And so when the Bureau came out with Regulation 5416D, which was, as we're, we're terming it, delivery freedom, and it essentially says that delivery services have the ability to deliver into any municipality in the state of California, they are viewing that as a clarification of existing law. And so that's why they felt, well, SB 1302, the Lara bill that was trying to go and make it explicit in state law, um, and, then, and that would then have directed the Bureau to you know, make that clarification. The Bureau then felt they had en enough authority within existing law to make the clarification on their own accord. So um, you know, if you're trying to force the regulators to do something, a law will make them go and do that, but they do have flexibility within their own administrative um, regulations. Love me a wonky answer. Thank you, Max. Um, so I think, yes, please, please. So I'll give you, uh, you asked about the legislative process. Yeah. So as many of you know, I was one of the five, five legislators, uh, because of the founding five that helped write the rules for medical marijuana. One of the founding five, I'm not going to mention names, believed in local control. And since we're all males, I can say, and he was passing around that bill to try to get it done. And he wanted to start with the founding five, because if you know or don't know, if, if all five of us sign on to something, there's a pretty good chance that it will be made into law. I was the one that said, BS, this is stupid. If, if your city doesn't want cannabis, but they want to deny individuals who need it for medical purposes from having it delivered, I'm not down with that. Right. And so, right. 
So I refused to sign, and you could see it start to lose some steam and ultimately um, go away. The governor, too, believed in local control, but he also believed that we need to get it to as many people medically as possible, and he didn't want to interrupt that, and that might be why some movement was made administratively, which the governor has control over. And so it's, a, it, it's, it's kind of the checks and balances of where if, if we're all working together on the, same, on the same wavelength, we can get something done quicker through the administrative process, or you take that long, laborious process that I have to go through, which takes a year, and then it's, what, enacted three months later. Um, we can do that long process. So it, it's, it's, it's both. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, you want to add? I'll just quickly say, you know, to the original question, the, the agencies may not break the law. Obviously, they are responsible for implementing the law, and they have a lot of wiggle room within what they do to implement the law. Um, you know, think about some of the things that have been achieved through regs, the type S shared license, distro transport, transport only. You know, there are a lot of relatively big pieces that have come out of the reg process. If it doesn't break the law, and it doesn't break any other law, but it will help them implement it, they can do it. So, you know, three years ago, we were all legislative. We're going to need to learn more about regulatory affairs. Interesting, interesting. So, uh, Assemblymember Joan Sawyer made a little reference to the governor earlier, and in fact, I think someone said that we have a bill waiting on the current governor's desk, but we also all know there is an election happening very soon. I think most people are sort of assuming at this point that we're expecting um, a Governor Gavin Newsom in our future. I'm curious for all of our uh, folks on the panel, what is going to change uh, once we have a presumably uh, Gavin Newsom as our governor? Or do you not think he's going to be governor? <laughs> but what's going to change for Canada? <laughs> Sure. I mean, I'm never shy, I guess. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know that much will change. The checks and balances that Mr. Lockyer outlined uh, are, are still present. Uh, there are still a lot of steps in the process. The governor certainly holds a lot of influence over Sacramento, but you know, the, the, the five are still there. There are still a lot of lawmakers, there are agencies. Um, you know, I think what we can say with certainty is that Mr. Newsom did support Prop 64. Um, you can read his own words. He supported it um, largely through, you know, he doesn't want his kids around it. He doesn't like it. He wants it regulated and controlled. That's sort of a synopsis of a handful of his quotes. But he, he's not a, a, a real pro-cannabis, free-the-weed sort of a guy. That said, he's also a pretty reasonable guy who recognizes that the past policy regime has, has failed us pretty, pretty pretty uh, grandly. Um, so I, I think that we can expect no backsliding. Things will continue to progress. I mean, I think if Cox were to pull the votes together, that we could, we'd probably expect to see some, some really, uh, some regress. And so, you know, I think we can expect solid uh, stability at the very least. I don't know that we should be expecting any big structural changes to regulation in the next few years, though. I think that you know, the concrete is setting up on the foundation and now we're going to build it. So any big changes, uh, you probably need to go back to the voters if you have those in your imagination. Right now is a good time to, to build with what we have. The, the, it's been set and I expect the next administration will largely follow through on that. And probably Mr. Mr. Lockyer probably has more experience that than about being a candidate I used to, or being an activist sitting out in the audience and saying what you should do being a candidate and saying what you will do, and then when you finally get into a statewide office and do what you're supposed to do, it's completely different. And uh, you have all these different hats, and I'm hoping that uh, when Governor Newsom gets in, that because he has a good business background, um, because he's been progressive on a lot of issues, especially this, and, uh, and, and that he has a concern for um, protections and, and making sure that the that we do this legally, that when we bring tax break, I mean, that when we bring tax breaks forward for this industry, he will have a better understanding of how if you give someone a tax break, that will bring in that's an investment in that industry, which should bring back more money into the general fund. I think a lot of times elected officials are reticent to do that because they don't know how much money is going in. They'd rather see how much money come in first 
before the other. Again, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And if you're a business person, you, you look at tax breaks as uh, incentives to bring in more money to make their business thrive. And I think sometimes um, elected officials, and I'm not gonna pick on any one party, but sometimes elected officials don't see it that way. They see the general fund going down every time you give a tax break. And it's not always that way. Sometimes you can spur an industry on. Uh, the, the one I'm thinking of is the, the, the internet and, and our, our whole, you know, the thing we're talking about net neutrality and all of that. We had to start coming in after we let that industry thrive with little or no government intervention. Now we're coming in on the back end to do some things. I think right now with this industry, we want to do it right and at the right pace, and that's that's the struggle. And so I'm hoping that Mr. Newsom will really take the tax incentive part and run with it like crazy. Right. Mr. Rock, do you want anything? Well, I first of all think uh, Gavin Newsom will be the next governor, uh, that he clearly understands and participated in uh, writing the new law. Um, and is an advocate for it. So whether it's uh, robust enforcement or protecting small entry players or those that have been in the business a long time, those are all stated uh, goals. And I don't expect the law to change a lot, but what's really gonna change is the marketplace. I'm surprised to hear you mention that Governor Newsom or Lieutenant Governor Newsom might be protecting small players. I think that's right. Okay. <laughs> Aaron, do you wanna ask me? Well, I just wanted to, to add on that. I think that um, I, I, I'm hopeful anyway that we'll see more advocacy for California at the federal level. And, that, and, and not to say that Governor Brown hasn't advocated for California and defended California on cannabis and myriad of other issues in D.C. Uh, but I think because of uh, Governor, future Governor Newsom's role in, in the development of Prop 64, that we will see a more steadfast uh, advocate in the governor's office as we work to change federal laws. And I think it's it's really notable that we're seeing, a, and, and this will be the case in, I think, Colorado and other states that have developed cannabis markets where we're seeing uh, pro-cannabis governors likely to be elected. Um, but it's really notable that in an election year, it used to be really hard to get anybody on the record to talk about you know supporting reform, and they won't wait till next year. I mean, this was just a couple of years ago, that's how it was. Now, we're seeing members of Congress who never supported the issue, Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, for example, coming forward with comprehensive legislation uh, to, to curry favor with, with millennial voters, 70% of which support our issue uh, and the industry. Right, right, and becoming an issue, as we saw recently in the debate with Ted Cruz and Beto O'Rourke, it's more of a thing. Um, all right, so, yeah, please, Matt, anyone leave you behind? No, that's okay, just one last point here. Um, I, I anticipate the Newsom's actions as governor of cannabis will be will be oriented more towards the national stage. Um, he's got a long career ahead of him, and there is an office higher than governor of California. Okay, All right. and of course, I think we've seen him be a little more vocally pro cannabis than uh, Governor Brown. All right, so we're going to do one more question, and then we're going to do Q and A in like five minutes. If people are getting excited about their questions, if I haven't asked enough questions for you. Um, should we do regrets or should we do Canadian money? Where do you guys want to go with this? Let's do regrets. All right, great. So I'm curious, in the past three years, what each of you have seen, you know, from each of your experiences, if there was one thing you could change about how legalization has played out in California in the past three years, whether it's something you did, something, you know, the legislature did, whether it was this one rule that was in Prop 64 that you wish was different, what's the one thing that you really wish you could go back and change? Starting to be a pattern here. I'm still not shy, I suppose. I think the bottom line is that we needed a longer timeline. We had uh, 25 years of unregulated criminal marijuana, spelled with an H. Then we had 20 years of legal marijuana, a la Prop 215. Then these five got together and passed regulation. Well, all 80 of them passed it ultimately, but 120 of them passed regulations for medical. And then we threw an initiative right on top of it, and then we tried to get everything done by January 1st, 2018, which is completely impossible for bureaucrats without a budget, and it just doesn't work, and that's why everything's falling on its face. Yeah. Uh, um, 
I, I was a big supporter of a, you know, let's get medical regulated by 2018, let's make sure our patients are safe, let's just make sure compassionate care is at the core of the industry, and then let's build into and grow into adult use. The status quo wasn't working under Prop 215 by any means, but I'm not convinced that what we're going to end up with is going to be better in the short to midterm. Um, I think we rushed it, and I, I think that ultimately we should have taken the time to implement the MCRSA and then implement Prop 64. Um, and I also think it would have been nice if the protections for small businesses in Prop 64 were actually enforced. Woo! Well, I, this is, an, I wouldn't say a regret, but one thing that I'd like to, to remind regulators and, and lawmakers and, the, and even the industry is that what the intent was behind regulating cannabis. It wasn't, it wasn't, it, it, voters didn't, didn't come to the ballot box because they wanted to go buy legal cannabis for the most part. It was because we promised that we would replace the criminal market with a regulated one and offer all of the societal and economic benefits that come with that. And we're doing it. Uh, but I think that we could do a better job at always looking at everything, especially at the, reg the regulatory level. All of these issues that we're talking about are actually creating barriers for us to be able to, to replace that criminal market. Right. So the ongoing criminalization of the unlicensed market, you feel like we've sort of lost track of what the goal was here? I, I think that we, we need to just continue to remember and keep that in mind as the vision behind what we're trying to do. And there will always be a criminal market until we have interstate and international commerce and we can export cannabis out of California like they're starting to do up in Canada now. Um, but always keeping that goal in mind is that that is the purpose and the intent behind the establishment of these, these modern cannabis laws. Yeah. Um, probably the, the, the greatest regret is uh, as we were going through how we're going to make this law happen um, in the legislature, one of the key things that we needed was local control. And that that's how we were able to get you know, 60 something votes in the assembly. Uh, I regret that we didn't come up with a formula whereby cities that do not want cannabis, oh, I'm sorry, elected officials who do not want cannabis yeah. in their cities, that we didn't devise a way, maybe limited um, licensing in, in, in districts that don't want it, but we needed to get some way to get the nose the camel's nose underneath the tent, and we we didn't we didn't think of that. And uh, right now, uh, my 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 the reason I backed off is because I still firmly believe that when we have the next recession in California, the cities that have legalized cannabis will be able to continue to operate with limited or no right. no problems, while the others will start to have to fire fire police, um, reduce government. And then the people will say, my neighbor next door is not doing the same. What is the difference? And they'll see that as the revenue from cannabis. But that, again, to what others are saying, that's a long, that may take five years from now. We needed to do something where we gave a statewide license that may have provided, that may have guaranteed, I'm, I'm just making up a number, even if it was just one or five cannabis operations in any city, then at least you could we could do the experiment in that city, make sure it's done right, and then hopefully the elected officials get that comfort level, or, or the citizenry get that comfort level to say, you know what, it's legal, let's move on. And I liken that the same as liquor stores. I don't want over proliferation of liquor stores in, in my area, but I'm not gonna say there should be no more liquor stores in the city of Los Angeles. And so there, there's a way to do it, we just couldn't, we just didn't, at the time we were going so fast, we just want to get it done, and, and, and we said we would come back. And maybe that's something we could look at later on this next session, how we can statewide make it mandatory and on a limited basis. Thank you. Matt, Mr. Locker, would you like to add a regret? I, I'd just like to echo a bit on what um, the Senate member said. Um, you know, cities and counties, they could not handle local control. They, there, it was so big, it coming at them so fast, especially with a constantly changing state framework, which gave them the excuse of, 
the regulations are permanent. We're in the MRSA regulations. We're in the MERS regulations. We're in the emergency regulations that are proposed. Right now, they're proposed. Now we're working on the draft final regulations. Just kick the can down the road repeatedly. But going back to the point, uh, the previous point, you don't ban cannabis. You ban legal cannabis. And all these cities with all these bans and refusal to license has just gone and left that and see that area to the illicit market. And so, you know, there was too much local control and the ability to ban, you know, should not necessarily have been on the table. And the problem is especially going back to the very first bills. One of the very first bills had a drafting error. That drafting error went and said, if you do not regulate by March 1, 2016, regulate cultivation, then you lose your local control over cultivation. That caused you know, what's been termed Banapalooza, and where you know, vast 80, 90% of the jurisdictions in the state banned all those medical cannabis activity because of drafting error that was replaced by February. So the amount of damage done between signing the bills in October and repealing that part in February and March. Um, we haven't gotten back from that to a degree. We haven't gotten back from those bans. And you know, between that drafting error and local control, um, those are things that you know, hindsight says we should have avoided. For sure, for sure. And of course, uh, as everyone who is here probably already knows, the vast majority of municipalities in California is banning commercial cannabis sales. Mr. Alfred, is there something you want to add? We're almost ready for our Q&A otherwise. You got, you got a regret? What do you regret? Well, I, I would only <laughs> agree with the comments made that we could have taken more, more time on the front end, although there was some urgency that it developed over the years, to kind of get it right. Yeah. Uh, and the, the local control agreement was an absolutely essential part of getting something done. It sure. wasn't going to happen without it. And so over the future years, there'll be a re-debate and rediscussion and fine-tuning, and it, it'll take a while. But I think Reggie's right when he says, some, my neighbor is buying it down the street and lives in this town. Why, aren't, why can't I buy it here? So yeah. ultimately, the economic logic remains. Yeah, thank you. So friends, this has been really fun. Let's do some questions. I think Susan would like it if you line up. Is that what works yeah. for you? Yeah. Okay, Jackie, go. <laughs> yes. Yes. Amanda, great panel. Everyone, thank you so much. A lot of heavy hitters up here. Really appreciate everybody's work. My question is for Locke here. Um, I don't know if you're aware of a story that just happened two and a half weeks ago about a licensed transporter um, that had Department of Homeland Security seize $230,000. It's a case that Mark Wasserman and Matt Cuban are representing. Um, they're going to be filing an injunction against the CHP who made the initial call. Um, now that you're a licensed distributor, are you going to advocate on behalf of distribu distributors to ensure that the federal government does not continue to make this uh, a new reality for the licensed industry? Or are you going to wait till you're, uh, until you're the next victim? Sort of a Hobbesian choice. No. Uh, well, I'm an advocate for the cannabis industry. That's the right. Can I change the federal government? No. I, the voters hopefully will. Um, first of all, uh, my name is Michael Howard. I'm with uh, 3C Cannabis Consulting. Uh, and I'd like to say that uh, you're the best moderator I think I've ever seen. <laughs> so that was not a question. My question is, my question is, um, I've heard rumors that there's going to be a second comment period for California for the regulations uh, to become permanent. So um, what would you say is one or two things, uh, particularly uh, 
Aaron and Hezekiah, um, that one or two things that you know, really are sort of out of place or that you'd like, like to have tweaked to make permanent? So the answer is yes, she is the best moderator ever. <laughs> um, if there is a second rule, uh, comment process on the rules, it will be limited in scope. Um, and the only reason that a second comment period would be triggered is if substantial, significant changes are made to the rules that we all commented on before. And while it's not actually statutorily required that comments be focused on those changes, it's generally viewed that a second 15-day supplemental comment period would be focused on changes that have already been made. The consideration of a next round of changes is, is likely to be deferred until the next rulemaking process. So comment on whatever you like, but really, when we see the next draft of the regs, look at what's changed, and that should be the focus for those supplemental comments. And we don't know what those things are yet because we haven't seen them. 15 um, day, one five? 15, one five day is the supplemental, I believe. I don't know, Dale, you would. Reggie, Bill, you guys might know these. I think that's it. I think it's a 15-day supplemental if they make substantial changes. Thanks. Just clarifying. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi. Joan Irvine, we sponsor tech. We do online youth safety. Uh, you were talking about delivery, and this is really for uh, Bill and Reggie. Uh, just recently, there was a campaign, Stop Wandering Weed, by the <laughs> California Police Chief Association and the League of Cities that are trying to use youth. There was a cartoon with kids in front of, and I have a copy of it at our booth, kids in front of a school and a marijuana truck there. And this is coming out from the Police Chiefs Association. What is it that you two can be doing to help them stop youth fear-mongering around youth, recognizing that nobody in this industry wants youth to come into their store or be delivering to youth? But I mean, when I saw that, I said, I mean, I just couldn't believe that they did this, so. Uh, one of the things that this industry needs to do, because you can't stop law enforcement from spreading what they believe is right. Uh, and some of it can be pretty drastic, what you see. And they have to do that to catch your attention to make, this industry needs to fight back. I, mean, I think Med Men now has an ad, and I advertise for Med Men, where they show regular people who use uh, adult use cannabis. Uh, I wish they had a politician in there too, but they, they show nurses and doctors and teachers. We need to let people know, regular people use it, but more important for medical cannabis, we need to let people know it's for veterans with PTSD, for seniors with, with arthritis and medical ailments, and for people with cancer. We need to get that message out, and we need to put our own money, and you know, that's, that's probably not my money, but at least you put your money <laughs> It's some kind of advertising campaign to show the benefits of cannabis. If otherwise, the only voice they hear is that. And we can counter, we could make an unbelievable counter to, to their argument that would just squash them um, to no end. Even an ad showing that this industry is not into having like ice cream trucks running through the neighborhood and selling cannabis to kids. So if anyone from MedMen is here, sounds like the assembly member's offering to star in a political campaign for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. How you guys doing? Thank you guys for coming and talking to us. I know you very well. I see you on Facebook. You're a good man. Uh, my name is Jason David. I'm Jaden David's father, the first child on national television to ever use medical cannabis. Uh, started the worldwide medical marijuana for children. Uh, a few things she said was pretty good, except for the kids do need it, and I do want kids in my dispensaries. Uh, you said education, that's all I ever do. I do support groups every single month for our veterans, but not just that, also uh, we feed them, we give them medicine, we have doctors, chiropractors and everything, and we're educating people about cannabis. I came here and I wanted to talk to you guys about two different things. First thing is about regulations. It's been a nightmare, of course. I think you guys need to talk to more of the dispensaries and who's living it, not just that. Um, the extraction facility's been a nightmare with the testing. Our patients need the medicine, it's life and death. This is not a joke, this is not a vaping, this is life and death for children. My youngest patient is two months old. I had a 10 month old baby sitting out front of my store about three weeks ago. We couldn't get the Jaden juice fast enough because of testing. Having a seizure in front of the store, I had one last bottle. I had to drive home half an hour, pick it up, come back, give it to a child because the testing and rules and regulations have ruined it for these families that are um, desperate for life-saving medicine. 
Sir, I think we all appreciate what you're doing. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, now, well, my first thing was a statement. Second thing is a question. Who's going to remember the, the patients? As we've been changing into this two from 215 to 64, the patients have been forgotten. Um, patients need medicine, and it's getting very expensive. And that's why I came here, not just for the complaints and the about the about the medicine, but who's going to help out the patients? Is anyone going to come out there and? and and help us out, become a hero for the patients who need the medicine that can't afford it? Great, great question. So this year, uh, I worked with Operation EVAC, a veterans cannabis organization, along with the California the Cannabis Compassion Coalition on Senate Bill 829 by Senator Scott Wiener. That's the Compassion Bill. Senator Wiener is going to be here there today to go and give his talk um, on that in more detail. But essentially, we want to be able to allow retailers and allow all the supply chain to be able to provide cannabis products to patients that have a recommendation, not just an ID card, and allow them to be provided, for ta provided tax free so that you would not be taxed on the cultivation, you would not be taxed on the excise, you would not be taxed on the use tax. So if you wanted to give the product away, and that would be at a loss for the retailer, but you would be able to do that without the government penalizing you. So that was the first step on compassion, and I think it was the first time really since, you know, we regret that in Macursa there wasn't strong protections for compassion, and this bill is a very good step, and a, but also a very first step on bringing compassion back to the legal, regulated cannabis market. Um, I I'll say, you know, same as Max, working on that bill demonstrated that um, patients aren't forgotten. You know, there was a vote out of the legislature in both houses. There was a signature, and so I, I think the political will is there. I know Mr. Jones Sawyer and his colleagues very much do want to see patients have it. Um, part of the frustration that I feel is this sort of rush to establish profitable market when there are literally children dying for want of, of clean products, and so. You know, I'm not going to be that hero. I don't know how I can do it, but every one of you, if you're investing in, if you're operating in, if you're supporting the cannabis industry, you have to not forget. It's up to every single one of us to remember what this plant has been for for the last thousands, thousands of years we've used it. The, the, the advancements, I mean, you know it more than me. You see it every day. This is literally life or death for children. And we all need to remember that. We all need to step up. If you're investing, put 1% into advocacy. The businesses can support their own advocacy. They can pay for their own associations. Invest in compassion. You need to do it, or else we're gonna keep talking shit. I'll just be honest with you. So the question, and, sorry, go ahead. And, uh, so I, I'm, the, I'm the first elected official to smoke cannabis in public with Melissa. Yeah. Yeah. And then Elon Musk, did the same thing and caught hell. The, the, the point I'm making is, the reason I did it, because I did it leading with medical cannabis. Melissa Ether has cancer, she uses it for a cancer treatment other than the pharmaceutical industry. And that's what we were promoting. And I think that's why I didn't catch a lot of, I didn't catch any grief from that. Other than, I think my, my district is kind of cool with that, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> And, and so I think we, if we lead with the victims or the people who need it, we will be able to, to get other people, even elected officials and others to say, you know what, this is not a bad industry. This, and so if you do set aside 1%, lead with medical. Show the victims, not the victims, show the patients that actually need this and show how the family members are much happier now. I think we will move a lot faster once we get rid of that 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 cannabis, that marijuana madness kind of feeling. If we if we do that, we'll, we'll be far ahead of anybody else. So I think the question was, does anyone want to be a hero? Max said, sure me. Hezekiah said, not me. As other members said, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> and I think we're at ten thirty. Uh, our next panel is. Oh, do we want to do one more question? Your timing, Susan, it's 10.30. All right, let's do one more question. Hello, I'm Clark Brown. I'm an attorney working on banking issues. Um, first, I just want to say a thank you to each one of you. Uh, this uh, cannabis issue is a challenging cultural issue, and it requires a lot of leadership and bravery to push into it. And each one of you have 
uh, put a lot of time and effort into that, so thank you. Um, besides that on banking, I missed the beginning of the panel. I don't know if there was an update. So a quick question is, is there a pathway forward to develop on banking in California yet? Uh, the board of directors of banks that I speak to are operating out of fear. They do not want to take on uh, a target on their back from a federal uh, agency. And the simple uh, response to me is, why on earth would I put my bank at risk? Um, so that's a question, is there an update? Secondly, on the prior conversation about maybe Governor uh, Newsom, how do we avoid this issue becoming the poster child for the polarization that now exists throughout all politics? It, the people on the other side of this issue, Governor New Newsom rolls in to start advocating nationally for this, easily can displace the, the real issues and get into uh, just inflamed partisan uh, politicking. So I'm very concerned that even a well-meaning Governor Newsom is just going to create what is an uh, ignorant firestorm about what this issue is. Just kind of on the, on the banking front, uh, you're absolutely right that this, this is one of the symptoms of the, the conflict between federal and state law that, that all, everybody in this room probably deals with every day on some level. Um, we have seen that uh, there is bipartisan support in, in Congress in both chambers, but as uh, for, for reforming banking uh, laws, the, the money laundering uh, statutes, as well as Bank Secrecy Act, to carve out an exception for state licensed businesses. But uh, as General Lockyer said, government doesn't work very quickly. Um, I am of the opinion now that uh, the banking issue will probably be resolved in a more of a comprehensive package, like the States Act at the federal level. Uh, but looking to states, and maybe Assemblymember uh, Joan Sawyer can speak to the, the state, uh, the, the progress happening here in the state. Uh, but again, uh, like has already been said, everybody here, if you care about this issue, it's time to invest in the policy reforms that aren't happening by themselves. The reason that we took the banking issue from something that no, hardly anybody knew about in Washington, D.C. to uh, by, something that has bipartisan support uh, and is front and center is because of the relationships that all of the, the responsible businesses allowed us to develop in D.C. Um, I'll just say quickly, you know, in addition to, I, I share Aaron's confidence at the national level for the first time in several years, I think that um, things are going to move and, and kudos to NCIA for, for moving in that direction and getting us in that position. So we've got hope on the horizon at the federal level. I also want to point to uh, State Treasurer John Chung's efforts with the Cannabis Banking Working Group over the last, uh, well, previous year. Those have resulted in a couple exciting things. I, I think that uh, maybe Tim will update you all on that a little bit later in the day, but two things that came out of that process that give me a lot of hope. First and foremost, the, the State Treasurer's Office is moving forward with a feasibility study on a special state charter institution. Um, I'll say that it is already legal for banks to bank us. They're just choosing not to because of a risk calculation, as you mentioned. I think that hopefully this state charter will not create a state bank per se, but will give banks a higher confidence, lower risk profile in moving into the space, or better yet, maybe a group of entrepreneurs will seize the opportunity and create a bank through that charter process specifically for us. Secondly, there is now a multi-state consortium that brings together local governments, state governments, industry, um, as well as the financial industry. Um, Aaron and NCIA are working with that group. We are working with that group as treasurers from Maine, Illinois, a bunch of different states. Um, and the goal is specifically to set legal states up to help that effort in DC. And both of those things, I think, are new alignments of influence uh, that didn't exist before. To, to the second piece, um, your question about polarizing, I don't see cannabis as a polarizing issue. I've gotten high in West Virginia, I've gotten high in Oklahoma, I've gotten high in Louisiana, and I tell you what, the reddest of the red counties and parishes, like, they're getting high too. So I, I actually see, this is probably more of like a high floating political pundit polarization. The American people aren't polarized on this issue, and if they are, it's, it's you know, that generation's Polls are consistent. Polls are consistently showing over ninety percent of the country supports medical cannabis. Yeah, I don't think it's a polarizing issue anymore, and, and it's getting less so every day. And I think the, the real problem is fear. And you know, I I, I sleep with a banker. She works at Wells Fargo. I know how bankers think. <laughs> they don't lend you money unless they look at your credit report because of fear. 
They don't take a chance on you. They don't lend you money for a house unless you have collateral and you show them because of fear. They fear that you will fail. And so I, I get why banks don't want to move forward with it because in their nature and their business practice, it's based on risk and reward. And uh, the risk is you lose everything. All of it, they can just seize everything. And no individual banker want to do that. There is a discussion, and I don't know if I let the cat out, but there is a discussion with about four or five Western states about starting a bank of their own and then have the federal government try to shut down a multinational state bank and then we fight them as, as a group. And they're all in the West, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, um, and let's, let's do that and see what happens and see if we can we, if we collectively push back on that and then then it's our money we put in our money from different states investors who are willing to take that risk to make that happen so there is discussion but to pull the trigger is still f-e-a-r it's not just a book it's it's real friends thank you very much